your remarks and then uh, on to your questions. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I guess I'll start with the injuries. We have, uh, as you notice, Luke Gifford didn't play the other night. He has a hip problem that I, I would say the best way to describe it right now is still questionable. Uh, we'll know more as the week goes on. Antonio Reed uh, re-injured his knee. We hope he's going to be okay, but I guess there's still a question mark there. Aaron Williams re-injured his neck. It's all soft tissue. We hope that he comes back and can play, but I'm not sure right now. Eric Lee is going through the concussion protocol. Uh, Michael Decker is out indefinitely, uh, probably for the season. Uh, and Tanner Farmer is out for an extended period of time with a high ankle sprain. Uh, Jalen Bradley actually also sprained his ankle. We hope that comes along so he can play this week. Uh, Zach Darlington was, was sick and missed the game. Uh, uh, hopefully he'll be getting better this week. And Ty Ferguson is out for an extended period of time. So that's kind of our list from there. Uh, summarizing the game, uh, it was uh, obviously great for our team to win. It was all hard. It was, uh, I think, uh, you know, the thing that we've been in and talked about so many times this year is, is games are won late and you just have to keep playing. Uh, so I appreciated the poise and the perseverance uh, and uh, the performance almost in all areas in the last 10 minutes in particular to, to win the game. Uh, defensively, we, we gave up six explosive plays. Um, a lot of those were due to missed tackles. Uh, we, were, we were good in the area of uh, third down. They were three of 13 on third down. And on the missed tackle deal, we gave up 45 yards after contact. Uh, which resulted in some of those big plays. Uh, I was, I was uh, especially proud of, of guys that were kind of the next man in. You know, we had, we had all the safeties back, and all of a sudden it seemed like they were out. And Markel Dismuke went in and did a nice job uh, for our team. Jacob Winemaster went in for a bit and made some plays. That was neat to see. Colin Miller went in and made some plays. That was good to see. Uh, and I think that when you talk about guys defensively that played well, you, Chris Weber had one of his best games. Mick Stoltenberg had one of his very best games. Uh, Lamar Jackson played real, real well in the game. <clears throat> and Marcus Newby did a great job. Offensively, you know, when you talk about the players that played well, you start with Tanner. I thought he had an outstanding day. Tyler Hoppus, that's what uh, I've been waiting to see there at that position. J.D., uh, Stanley, DeMornay all made some nice plays, and then uh, Jalen Bradley went in and gave us a spark. Uh, we had 10 explosive plays offensively. Uh, we were okay, I think, on, th on third down, not quite 50%, but pretty good. Uh, and Tanner's numbers were good with no interceptions. And Jalen Bradley, like I said, he, he made some good runs and did a good job. Uh, special teams. Uh, the distance wasn't great, but uh, Lightborn put the punts where they had no return yards. Uh, you know, Luke McNitt had a, a nice day on special teams. Colin Miller made a big play on a kickoff. Eli Sullivan got in the stat books for a tackle. That was neat to see. And Jeremiah Stovall continues to do real well on special teams. He's a factor in there. Drew Brown was outstanding. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed it as, as a game was taking place, but we had a new holder in there because Zach was sick. Isaac Armstrong went in, and and that was kind of seamless, which is not that easy to do, you know, when you're used to your holder after such a long period of time. And then I thought DeMornay did a great job on just fair catching short punts. Uh, I think their net was somewhere, you know, 34-ish, something like that. So we won the field position battle on special teams. Uh, we're facing a Northwestern team that is a really good, solid football team. They have a, a, a you know, an experienced veteran quarterback that's now played a long time. Seems like he's been there forever. 
um, and they have an outstanding running back that we're going to have to contend with. Um, so they're, what the, they spread you out, throw the football, and use the running back in a very smart way. And then uh, their defense is really, really stout against the run. <coughs> they're well coached and play hard. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the middle linebacker is really a good player, as is their nose tackle number one. Uh, so we're, it's going to be another one of those kind of games. It's going to be a tough game. They've won two overtime games in a row, which says something about their team, too, about how they play. Uh, I'll, from there, I'll open it up to questions and see where we go. Stout first to run, you say about Northwestern. Is that, do you have like a conversation with Danny and say, be patient with that run game, maybe? Do you ever have this? Yeah, we've had a long talk last night and this morning about the running game and what we're going to try to do and what's the best way to attack this. They've been really good uh, run defense. So I think being selective uh, and probably having uh, a run or two that is repeatable, uh, I don't think it's wise to have a whole bunch of stuff you try to execute against this defense. I think if we can get, get a, uh, some balance going and some counter type plays going, you know, curveball plays to what might be a base run or two would be good, uh, but something that is repeatable that we can do because uh, you got to get a feel for them. They've been, you know, <clears throat> all the teams, Wisconsin, Penn State have had, uh, for a time, had a hard time finding the runs. So we got we got to be very selective with that and uh, and try to find that good balance in the game. We don't want to lose that idea uh, at all, but uh, it, it does have to be very selective, Steve, as we look at it. Mike, why, why do you, can you put your finger on just why the run game has struggled so much? Well, you know, I think that uh, it, it's probably pretty simply uh, the, the whole idea of, of winning the one-on-one -on -one matchups up front um, and 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 then, you know, from there, being able to do that uh, kind of repeatedly so you have good running stats at the end. I don't have any other magic formula to it. You've got to block them. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, then, you know, the, I think we have good runners. And, and uh, I, think, I think we did miss a couple of opportunities the other night running the ball, actually in the ball game, but uh, um, you got to block. I mean, are you surprised that it's kind of played out that way that you guys started? Well, we, we, we certainly never intended to be like this uh, with, the, with the running stats. Um, we are going to continue to try to strive to be that team um, and then do what we need to do to win the game. You know, that's a good question. We'll talk about that more as the week goes. We see him, and uh, we certainly intend to, to play him. You know, that was our intention in the last game. We were going to try to get him more carries. On that offensive line, are you, are you looking at Cole Conrad, Matt Farniak right now? Again, yeah. Or could Will Wilson or someone get a chance? I mean, anything different? No, we're looking just to what you just said at first, and, and Bo will be a next man in uh, there at guard. Uh, I actually like Matt at guard a lot. You know, I think that that will be his his position now and in the future. I think that's where he's best suited physically, strong, and and uh, I think he'll be a good fit in there. Why do you think you guys have struggled with the red zone on offense? Man, uh, you know, it's it, when when one thing that, that you start with there, Sam, is the best way to score in the red zone is to run it in, and we're not running very well. And then the the passes are, you know, there's there's smaller windows. Uh, um, you know, we we <clears throat> doesn't help, but we just missed, you know, some opportunities to make some plays. Uh, but I think if you could r actually run more effectively, I, you know, I've been waiting to get in a situation where we're down in there and and we could use a a good play action pass or a bootleg that, that we've got ready for the game. But the situation 
because the run hasn't been very good. It hasn't been very good for that either. And we get we get third and goal or something, and the, those those are those are tougher. You know, we we got to make the plays. And like I said, we just missed on a couple of opportunities to make those plays. But uh, that's really the issue, the balance down there too, I think. Hey, Mike, a guy like Hymas going forward, and I think this will be his seventh start. Yeah. Uh, you're getting deep into the season. These teams are very physical. Is it more of a mental challenge for a, a, a freshman like that or a more of a, 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 is it a physical challenge or more of a mental challenge? Well, the, the, <laughs> For any freshman, we'll start with that. I think that uh, they always, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but maybe it is at the, at the uh, how long it is, you know, how, how, and, and how repetitious, repetitious it is through time that, that you know, it, it, uh, it's more football than they've ever played, you know, starting from fall camp all the way into it. So. You know, we've always worried about those freshmen and talked about it in our past about hitting that, that uh, whatever that is, that block, you know, out there that, that it's like they're affected by that length of time and that grueling schedule. Uh, Hymas uh, appears to be really, really pretty stable every day. Same guy, uh, comes to work. Uh, you know, he did play. At a, at a very good football program in high school that played well into the playoffs. So they played, I don't know if they played 15 games, but maybe they did, you know. So he's, he, he's used to a lot of football. Maybe that helps him or maybe who he is personally helps him more than that. But I uh, haven't noticed any of that with him hitting, okay. hitting the ledge. Yeah, the red zone. Um, <laughs> from, from his goal line to the 20, Aaron's about 60. 20 to the opposing goal line, the red zone, he's 40%. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on why? I think it's those windows that are smaller and the op, you know, and, and you know, like I said, we're, he, he's, he's off the fingertips two or three times in the game. And so it's very finite or small of, of what you have to do to accomplish the execution down there. And then, and then, for us, we always have to reassess exactly what we're trying to do and have a good plan against each team. Uh, and, uh, you know, those balls often are bang, bang throws, slants, underneath routes that go in. Uh, we, we don't live off of the fade down there, but uh, similar type plays to that, you know, those layered type plays. We, we, we've got to be better at them. We've got to be thoughtful about what we do than, than the execution has to be on. You've had teams where you had that big body 6'3", 6'4", receiver that you could throw you down there. Then you've had teams that didn't have that. How much do, does just one of those guys help uh, to, to have somebody down there like that? And when you haven't had one, have you had to do something different yeah. to, to make it work better? For yeah, you know, I think that uh, that is a really good point. When we've been good, we've had that guy that can slant or fade catch big. And then uh, when we had a guy like Brandon Cooks, we actually were able to do him on some move stuff, you know, in and out. You, you so quick that uh, it's just bang and come back out. And we've we've had good success with people like that. Uh, and and that's where you know, with uh, looking at what you do is really really important. And then who you're doing it with is just as important and what they can do. Mike, uh, Tanner did what he did the other night and, and, and got the win. But how, how much are you guys living on the edge by putting that kind of pressure on him? To well, that's, that's kind of the – even I think Sam asked the question after the game about that. Uh, you know, some – you, you have to play the game you're in. When we're in it, and this is what we have to do to get get back in it, uh, then you do it. Uh, in a in a more perfect world, the balance would help the quarterback. If the balance would help the line eventually, if we can run better than we're running. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, you know we're we're not necessarily in that perfect world. We're trying to find it, and we're going to continue to try to explore that best way to establish a running game that helps our team. 
uh, better than it does right now. Um, but like I said, when you're in the in the game like we were the other night, we had to do what we had to do, and uh, and and I I think that uh, the quarterback played real well, made some really tough plays, and got hit a lot too. You know, not sacked too much I, for 50, 53 passing attempts, and we got sacked three times in that. So that's not I'm not bragging about that, but that's not horrible. It could have been a lot worse, but he got rid of the ball, and made some plays. You guys ever thought about mixing in some tempo every once in a while to see yeah. the success you had with tempo um, in the fourth quarter? Have thought about that absolutely, you know, and uh, we've done that sometimes historically. Um, we're kind of we're 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 okay built for it, you know. It's not like we can't do that, obviously, but uh, you know, we have we have thought about. I have thought about. Um, what that might mean in the middle of a game. Mike, when you win the game the way you guys did, does that affect how you look at areas in which you guys struggle now going forward? You know, that's a, that's kind of a trap. You know, I think that uh, somebody told me once you can't overlook in victory what you would never overlook in a defeat. You know, and so what we didn't do, you know, we didn't necessarily tackle great all over the place, so we have to face that and improve that there there were some you know some interior s stuff defensively that allowed them some gaps that were open so we've got to correct those things you've got to look at all of that once the game's over it's just a tool you know and you it's going to be in the win or the loss column but you no matter what you have to look at it uh to make yourself better you know we we uh we know our flaws offensively we've already talked about them today and uh, and so it's really important that we try to go back and and make sure everybody understands that after the game. There were a lot of positives about that game and winning it, but there were a lot of things that uh, could have made it so much better. Like the red zone is one of them. I mean, that, that we kicked four field goals for a long time there. We had pretty good drives and not bad numbers offensively, but it wasn't resulting in many points, and that puts us down two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, so. You talked about the tackling in this game. How have you, how do you regard how the tackling has been during the course of the season? How have you seen it? You know, I, th I think that uh, for the most part, our, our, our tackling has, has been better this year. Um, I really appreciate how our defensive coaches coach tackling. Um, we we do it virtually every day, and then one day a week, it's it's a, it's a pretty lively session. Tuesday's practice is a pretty lively tackling session. Um, but even with that, with without necessarily taking guys to the ground all the time, the emphasis put on position for tackling, uh, the actual technique of tackling is really well coached by our defensive coaches. Um, and and so it becomes very obvious when we miss a tackle of what we can go back and work with that player on on doing and and how that goes. I think that uh, the emphasis for it in our practices has been good. Um, and and frankly, tackling in the game is never perfect, but you hope you can go back and help each individual and. <clears throat> And, and then it's going to be real easy to point out in the video with the players today of what those missed tackles meant to those drives. I mean, they were, that's how they got, I think, at least three of their explosive plays was missed tackles at the line of scrimmage. Morning had, I think, maybe seven spare catches. And yeah. Are there, did you have a return on for most of those? Or are there times Not all of them. You know, that. Probably half of those were with our defense still in the game, you know, because they're in that kind of gray area and what we were calling kind of a safe, safe punt return. So we're playing defense first and covering down, preventing fakes. They, they have, that team had historically from Western Kentucky been a big fake team. And so we were, we were aware of that. So we stayed. And when we leave our defense in, we don't have a great punt return set up. However, most of those punts were short and high and fair catch balls anyway. 
and I think the job that he did for catching the ball uh, provided us a good net. You know, when you're talking about 34 yards, that's not bad. That's not bad. Did you get any clarification on, on the passing appearance from the conference? Nothing official from the conference yet. That stuff has just gone in. We have had no response. We're pretty any, sure what we know what the deal is. So. During the, did they <laughs> say anything after the fact on the field, like, you know, what well, we missed that? Or did, did you get anything like that at all during the game? They did not go that far, but I could tell they were thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, uh, can you comment a little bit? On, I'm assuming that you have a pretty deep sense of satisfaction with Tanner, kind of how he overcame that rough start to the season with the interceptions. And I think it's been give or take 150 straight passes without an interception for him. Yeah. I mean, what's kind of your thought of as far as just how he's gone from where he started to where he's at? I think it, it says a lot about Tanner himself. You know, I think you have to have uh, quite a mentality to play the position. You know, I think that uh, it's, it's got to be that kind of next play mentality because you still got to go out there and make throws now. And, uh, and he never has backed down from making the throws. And he made some of them under real duress the other night. So <clears throat> I admire that part of it. And, and then I also think that uh, he's more comfortable with the offense. You know, so the more comfortable he gets and uh, the fact that he'll still make the throws and not be hesitant, that's what'll kill you. Uh, you know, you throw a couple interceptions and then you're kind of holding on the ball or real hesitant to do anything with it. He still does, he did his best job the other night of looking down the field for a throw and hitting the check down. You know, and those were valuable to us uh, as we went. So I, I, I uh, admire that growth. And I think it has a lot to do with he's a tough-minded guy that will still stand in there and make a throw even if it hadn't gone real well and uh, has been able to overcome, you know, the fact that that's early on what everybody was talking about. And so he, you got to be pretty tough mentally to do that, I think. So I admire that in him. And then, like I said, I think he's more comfortable with what we're doing and where to go with the football. Yeah. Yet since you've been here, you've neither signed nor aggressively pursued junior college. Players. Yeah. Why is that? Well, you know, I think that in, a, in an ideal world, if you can sign a freshman and develop them through a period of time, that that that, that helps your team most in the long run, Sam. I think that if you, you know, if, frankly, if you can get a freshman and, and he's the right guy and you redshirt him, then when by the time he's playing, he's had, you know, well over a year of just practicing and developing physically with you and then uh, is, is more prepared to play for you for a longer period of time. Uh, but, but, you know, there, 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 are, there are instances right now that we are looking at junior college players probably a little bit more. And, uh, and those, I think, when, when we ever did that, you know, one year we hit it right on with five guys that really impacted our team. And uh, it was, uh, it was sometimes that, you know, I think you're just kind of lucky when you, when you get that kind of a year. Uh, a corner, a linebacker, two defensive linemen, and a backup running back that went in when he got to play and gained 100 yards. So we were, we were in pretty good. That was a good year and it was right. And when you recruit a junior college player, you need to be right about their ability and their and their character and uh, and you've got to have a real plan for him because if it doesn't work he he knows his clock is short so he's unhappy nobody's happy you know it's it, so you've got to be you've got to be right on the deal uh, we have had uh, little success ever with offensive linemen although we are looking a little bit Right now, um, more success with uh, a receiver or linebacker uh, and a runner. Does the Big Ten, which traditionally does not sign junior college, do you ever get the sense that the Big Ten dissuades its members of the future? Yeah. Junior college players? And do you, you get the sense when you came here 
that, that, that there was a, we don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Kind of attitude. You know, I think uh, they're, they're, they're I, I'd ne I've never noted or heard anything conference-wide. When you say that, it does make sense to me because you don't see a lot of it in the Big Ten. I think that uh, everybody that talks about admissions and graduation are, are uh, I, I would say, I would use a word aware of the issues that might be involved there, of graduating this person, of, uh, of them being able to fit in academically. I think that there is maybe conference-wide, but for sure here, an awareness of that. Has that been communicated to you? No, I've just felt it I, as, you, as, you, as you look at guys. And, and like you said, we haven't looked at a lot. Uh, we've, we've brought some up. We've, we've evaluated some. Uh, but I, I don't, I've never felt anybody say no or, or a real pullback, but I think that there is an awareness of that. And I, and I think that, like I said, if you're going to join a guy like that to your team, you want the right ability, the right fit. This is our plan for you. This has got to work. And then they've got to be the right person, too. What thought process the, the number one junior college team in the nation is 60 mile, 55 miles away from Yeah. What kind of relationship do you feel like you guys have at this point? I think good. I think good. I think we're in contact with them a lot. We've looked, Billy and I just last week looked at, uh, uh, a couple of players on those on that team, and uh, they're impressive. I know Chris Jones was disappointed with his game last night. Um, what's, the, what's the challenge he's facing? It felt game? like last night, didn't it, Brian? Saturday, but it was Saturday. it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it wasn't that, that long ago. What's that challenge like for him and the obstacles that he's trying to overcome right now? After all that I think that's a good point for all of you to recognize how hard it is to just join in part way when you haven't played football for a long time. You know, it's, it's, it's not just getting back on the bike necessarily. When you talk about, you know, he's had a couple weeks of practice. He missed all of fall camp. He missed all the initial uh, kind of the inauguration into the season. He missed all of that. And then all of a sudden the speed of the game and what you have to do is all right there in front of you. So. Uh, I know he's probably disappointed, but it's not totally surprising. And, and uh, you, you hope that both ability-wise and, and his mindset is, is he's learned from that. When you look at the O-line, how close are guys like Bo Wilson and Laird? And I know they're what's as the backups now, but how close are they to those top-tier guys? And how do you feel about how that reserve group is growing behind him? That's a, that's a million dollar question that we have to, we, we have to stay on top of as far as Reardon, Bo Wilson, all, all the rest of those guys. And I'm going to leave some guys out. There's some, even some guys that are redshirting that we have to be really thoughtful about their continued growth, their readiness to play. I, re I really like Reardon and Bo Wilson physically. And so we've got to get them ready to go when the time comes for them either to play or to compete to play. Coach, on a personal level, how much did that win recharge you, I guess? Oh, I've been charged. I don't need any recharging. I, yeah, these, these games are all exciting to me, game by game, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and, and obviously we all know the situation. So, you know, but as far as – the team and getting ready to play, it's all a vacuum for me week to week. And um, the games are all really, really important and really exciting. And, and so I'm fired up for the next one. All right. Thank you, guys.